So uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, uh, 28th uh, annual Kirby Lectureship. Uh, today we have the illustrious uh, Michael Sag, who's going to talk to us about the dawn of HIV and where we've gone from there. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to say a few words about uh, Bill Kirby. Uh, many of you with gray hair like me uh, very fondly remember uh, Bill Kirby. Uh, he was one of the first uh, faculty members at the University of Washington, recruited in uh, 1949 uh, by uh, uh, Robert H. Williams. And uh, I, think, I think he was the uh, first, along with about five or six others, Clement Finch, uh, Robert Bruce, uh, Wade Volmiller, and Fred Plum. And I'm sure those uh, names mean a lot to uh, those of you that are gray like me. Uh, he was uh, uh, really the first infectious disease specialist in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but Bill was uh, many more things. He was a, a, a patient's kind of doctor. He, he listened to people really well. He was a fabulous mentor, uh, and he was a warm human being, as well as a, an accomplished scientist. So uh, Bill started out, was uh, uh, trained at Stanford, and then uh, uh, worked for a while in the 1940s in the penicillin uh, delivery group. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he was, remember that penicillin was extremely limited uh, in supplies first, and he was uh, with a team of doctors in the military that decided who got the limited supplies of uh, penicillin that I believe was being produced by Lilly at that time, and, and who didn't. And uh, uh, what a better guy to do that than, uh, than Bill Kirby. Then he came to University of Washington and uh, was well known for having described the emergence of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, uh, one of the first uh, leaders in that, and he developed along with uh, Bauer and Turk uh, the disk diffusion test for antibiotic susceptibility, which uh, retains the name of uh, Kirby-Bauer-Turk test. Um, we look at this every day in micro rounds down in the microbiology uh, 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 unit with the uh, fellows. and, and uh, fondly remember uh, Bill Kirby. Uh, as a, a, a gift to him, uh, while he was still living, uh, his family, friends, and colleagues all got together and created the Kirby Memorial Lectureship. Uh, when you look at the uh, last 28 and now 29 speakers that have come through the University of Washington and, and spoken as Kirby Lectureships, they're really the uh, who's who in U U.S. and international infectious diseases. And today we're proud to have in that tradition uh, uh, Michael Sag, uh, who is from University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, Michael was born in, uh, in uh, uh, Kentucky and uh, imagined himself going back to private practice there uh, to fulfill his mother's wishes to be a doctor's doctor. Uh, but he fell in love at the University of Alabama, Birmingham with uh, academic medicine. Uh, and this was at the uh, dawn of the HIV AIDS era. Uh, I, I remember that time, in fact, we're about exactly the same age, but I remember that time that it was more about hospice and spirituality and keeping people comfortable than it was about curing people uh, because it was a death sentence in those days. Michael uh, uh, was made some of the uh, seminal uh, observations in the laboratory about HIV, uh, he was the first to describe that HIV became so polymorphic in every single patient's blood uh, in an individual patient. Uh, he uh, uh, reminds me of, of, of uh, many lab escapades I had where he, he did a, wet, an, a southern blot showing the diversity of HIV viruses in, in patients' blood and then uh, uh, went on to uh, correctly assume that they were diversifying greatly in the uh, bloodstream, and this was probably explaining some of the immune uh, interference that was happening in HIV. Michael also uh, saw a woman who had a positive HIV test but had no risk factors in those days, and uh, quite correctly concluded that maybe the test is wrong, and, and sent her blood all over the country for testing, and then realized and wrote this up in the New England Journal, so we all became uh, aware of it, that the Western blot for HIV testing is not infallible, that if you have low-risk individuals, you should question positive Western blots. And this was an important 
uh, thing, not only for his individual patient, but across the country. Michael then formed the first uh, uh, HIV uh, clinic at University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, where they were getting referrals in from all over the region, hundreds and hundreds of patients uh, at that time, uh, uh, mainly for palliative care and, and for treating opportunistic infections and so on. He went to the University of uh, 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 to UCSF and uh, uh, took their best practices and actually uh, morphed them into even better practices Every patient went into a database. Every patient uh, uh, that agreed to donated samples and became part of a, a large nationwide study, which uh, Michael uh, Mike metastasized all over the country and put clinicians together. And all of this led to rapid access to best practices uh, for new antiretrovirals and now for how to keep uh, HIV positive patients that are doing pretty well alive uh, and free from uh, uh, metabolic complications. Mike's a, uh, an accomplished teacher. Uh, he wins, he has won the teaching prize so many times in UAB, I couldn't even uh, uh, count the number of, it, of the times. He's uh, a clinician's clinician, is on the, on the US top doctors list. Uh, he's a very accomplished academician, has published over 350 papers and uh, uh, over 60 book chapters and uh, uh, is funded until about the year uh, 2040, as far as I can tell. So uh, he's a successful guy, but actually he's really down to earth. And he's going to tell us about HIV as an example of translational medicine. So Michael, we're Thank proud you, to Wes. have you as it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, it, it, it's always an honor to be invited to give grand rounds at a, at a place like UW. Um, this is a special honor because the Kirby Lecture, uh, not only because of what it represents in terms of Bill Kirby, but also the ID division um, selects by vote. And so th the fact that uh, I was asked by colleagues to come here is, is extremely meaningful to me. So thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, this is going to be pitched mostly to students, residents, and fellows. Um, and I guess the rest of us can listen in. But the, the thought is how, we hear the word translational medicine all the time. And a lot of us find ourselves scratching our heads, what in the world is that? And HIV, I think, is a great example, not to say there aren't a lot of others, but it's a great example. So I'm gonna take you through a journey of how HIV from 1981 to today has been transformed from a death sentence to a chronic manageable condition. And the reason for this is the application of translational medicine. And, and as I go through it, I'll explain, but I'll start talking about how you take basic science principles and apply them to clinical practice. And that's what most people think of when they think of translation. But also on the other end of the spectrum, going into the community and learning from populations of patients to inform decisions as well. So that's kind of the big picture I have disclosures, uh, research funding to the institution, and a scientific advisor to a couple of companies. And so we're going to talk about the life cycle of HIV and how that applies to antiretroviral therapy, how art medicines stop HIV replication and how that plays in, um, how, and that's not Haas, how ARV resistance happens and translate the mechanisms into action. Tribute to Bill Kirby. I mean, for those of us not at UW, um, he's a legend, and I'm sure he is as, as well. But the fact that UAB, as I looked at the history of UW through this lens of Bill Kirby, um, are very similar institutions. They both started in the post-war 40s, um, visionary leadership of a lot of people, a growth in the community where it becomes a dominant force, uh, more so actually for UAB in Birmingham than perhaps here in Seattle because so Seattle has so many other industries. But at UAB, it's the largest employer in the state of Alabama, if you can buy that, it's true. Um, so, a lot of similarities, so I, I, I'm especially honored to be asked to give this lecture in his name. So, it's like most good grand rounds, I think, we start with a case, okay? Um, so, I'll move over here. A 23-year-old guy came in, this is 1986, no, 85, December, I'm a fellow. Um, three days of fever, sore throat, febrile skin rash, lymphadenopathy, he looks like he has mono. Um, his mono spot, though, is negative and his Eliza in Western blot for HIV or negative, and that's a skin rash, and barely got that before it disappeared. It, that wasn't there very long. 
So when I present this to medical students, I say, okay, what is this? And because they know I do HIV, they always pick answer four, and of course they're correct. But it could be mono, right? But it just wasn't. It was acute HIV seroconversion. And at that time, as a fellow, uh, our chief of ID was Glenn Cobbs at the time. And if those of you who know Glenn, I was walking down the hall, and he goes, hey, I got this guy on the hook. Okay, why don't you just come out and see you bye? That was the extent of the ask. I said, yeah, okay. So I'll scope him out. And it turned out that he had HIV seroconversion syndrome. So after talking to him and figuring this out, I drew blood, um, basically almost hooked him up to wall suction and took as much as we could allow and <laughs> put, my, put my pockets filled with the white coat filled with tubes and waddled down the hall to our lab. And we started studying this. And what we were trying to do is assess the quantity of virus that was in his bloodstream. And we didn't have PCR at the time, and even if we did, at that time you couldn't quantify you know, virus by PCR. So we started doing serial cultures, and we found ways to do that, and we compared them to other people. And you can see the people that had advanced disease here, um, they had higher levels of culturable virus than over here, but this guy was sort of off the top chart high because he had seroconversion syndrome. And then later we determined that when you treat, it goes down. But the, the, the real... The real big take-home point is that later, by having the stored sample, when quantitative PCR became available, and we had stored specimens on him, as well as hundreds of other patients, I got this phone call from um, uh, from uh, Jeff Lifson in uh, Redwood City, California, at a lab called Gene Labs, and they had figured out how to quantify PCR. So I get this phone call. It's a Thursday afternoon in June around 1992, and he says, I've got this thing, I ask him, I'm writing on, literally on a paper towel with a pencil what the procedure is, and I'm trying to think of what he's doing, I thought, that's pretty cool. He said, I hear you have samples. I said, sure. So I stopped what I was doing, ran down the hall, grabbed about 75 samples from him, and for him, and shipped them off, numbered them one through 75. He didn't know what they were, but of course they had asymptomatic people, they had acute seroconverters like our patient, and they had, um, Asymp uh, they had ARC patients that we called at the time in AIDS. And you can see that the, in all cases, the viral load was very high, and it came down after this acute seroconversion syndrome. And then it stabilized, and then it came back up. And this is how it worked all the way along. And if you, if you ended up treating, this thing went to zero. But what this said to us, as opposed to the other study that showed only those with advanced disease, you could culture virus, that the virus was actually present throughout. And those of us who were around at the time know that there was this thing called latency. It was a latent, clinically latent period. It really wasn't. What we were able to do is study and show that viral replication was enormously active throughout the course of infection. So here he is. Um, this is our guy. And now that we could, at some point we'd later, we measured the amount of virus. And to get back to Wes's point, the other thing we did was apply that concept of quasi-species. And when we looked at him, we saw that there was a uniform amount. And I'll show you that in a second. So this is called Phoebig classification, which is different stages after acute infection. So someone gets infected here. The virus kind of smolders, finds a home. And then once the immune system starts reacting, it starts firing off alarms like IL-2 and other things, which ironically and somewhat tragically activates CD4 cells so that they become cannon fodder for more virus. So it just builds on itself. You get this explosion of virus, and that's what the second part is. And so you can see on the y-axis here that there's 10 million or up to 10 million copies at the peak of viremia 20 days after infection. Then the immune system starts to at least gain some control, and then it settles out right about here, and this is called the viral load set point, and that's different for every patient. And the viral load set point basically is a balance between the virus, which is really pretty simple, and it, uh, pardon this to guys, but I, women get this, say the virus is like most men. All it wants to do is survive and replicate. Okay, so it's there churning, trying to do its thing, okay? And the host is trying to dampen it down. And so you get this battle, and it's an epic battle. And it goes on every day in every patient uh, between the virus and the host until you give the advantage to the host to get with antiretroviral therapy. And so some of the things 
that we could do is look at this period, like in this case of WEAU, we could pull virus from this initial seroconversion because Cobbs caught me in the hall and said, go scope them out. And by using his stored specimens, this is a series of clones done in the lab of George Shaw. And you see a few polymorphisms here, but clearly these are almost mono, monolithic or mono, they're, they're all the same, to say it in that way. And, but, but compared to, say, another patient who was maybe infected with two different variants, so you can clearly see there's this is variant one initially infected with, this is variant two. So, but the remarkable thing is that when somebody's first infected, it's usually only one, and then it replicates. And as the immune system kicks in, the virus mutates in a way and escapes. And you get this cat and mouse game of the immune system catching up, and then boom, the virus has changed and they can't stop it anymore. And that's the genesis of the so-called quasi-species. And folks here at UW and Larry Corey's group and uh, Julie McGrath, others, look working on the vaccine development era. That's what we're up against. We have to find a vaccine that protects against all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of different potential variants. When you think about it from a patient perspective, <clears throat> what I think happens is this. In the case of our patient, he had engaged in receptive rectal intercourse. So there's donor virus in his rectum. Here's his mucosa. This could be vaginal if it were uh, heterosexual sex. But a lot of the viruses try to come across the membrane, and they lead to an abortive infection. That's why infection is not 100%, right? In fact, per coital act, it's about a 1 in 300 chance or so of somebody getting infected. If there's tears in the mucosa, that, that gets a little bit more uh, possible. So the rate, the, possible, the, the rate goes to maybe 1 in 100. If there's ulcerative genital disease, like you've seen here with work from Connie Kellum and others, then the rate is about four times higher. But in normal mucosa, that's what it is. And so it's just every now and then this virus gets through and then it, it hits, and once it takes hold it by day 8, 10, or 12 or so, then it starts to replicate, and then you get the recruitment of the immune system that makes it even worse and amplifies. And there's just more studies looking at the same about this genetic evolution over time. And there's, I'm not going to go into all the details, but as the CTL epitope changes, the virus mutates. That's kind of what this is saying. So how do we apply this to treatment, all this Science. So that's how you apply uh, sequencing to understand what the virus is doing, how you apply PCR to understand what viral load is. Are there other things we can do? Well, as background, let's go back to what antiretroviral therapy does. And to do that, we go to the life cycle. So a virus comes down, finds a CD4 receptor and a CXCR4 or CCR5 co-receptor, enters in a single-stranded RNA, undergoes reverse transcription through that unique enzyme, and to double-stranded DNA, and then integrates into the host, and then later a virus is produced, and that's the life cycle. The point is that any place along this line now, we have drugs that can either block attachment and entry, can block reverse transcription, can block integration, or it doesn't actually block the production of a virus as it leaves a cell, but protease inhibitors interfere with the maturation once the virus leaves. The take-home point of all of this is that all the therapy we have today, every drug, protects the neighboring cell from becoming infected or protects the original cell from becoming infected. That's all it does. Once a cell is actually infected, that cell is infected. You can't do anything about it unless you cure the person, which we haven't figured out how to do yet. So all of our drugs are either blocking entry, blocking reverse transcription, blocking integration. That protects this cell from being infected. And if you block protease, then you block maturation. And so the neighboring cell over here wouldn't become infected. So that's the theme. Okay, so after working with Lifson on PCR, we decided that we would start studying the dynamics, looking at the rate of decline when we start therapy. And what we did is we have a graph, I'm going to show you after this, but that you can see within weeks of starting treatment, there's a two or three order of magnitude log drop, two or three log drop in just weeks. And that told us that replication must be very fast. But the question was how fast? So we partnered with a guy at... Um, Princeton, who is an Einstein professor of mathematics or something, at age 33, like most mathematicians, right? Bernoulli or whomever, and just a brilliant guy. 
and he, we, had, we showed him the data work with him, and this is what we came up with. So if you have HIV-infected cells here in the body, and the majority of cells obviously are uninfected, in fact, among the CD4 positive cells, most of them are not activated. And as I've already alluded to, it's really only those activated cells that become a cannon fodder for the virus. So less than 1%, a small fraction of the cells in the body are activated at any moment in time. So that's where it goes. So these guys produce virus, it comes down, infects those guys, and you get this cycle. Our question was, when we give antiretroviral therapy and block these uninfected cells, as I've already mentioned, from becoming infected, what's the decay rate of these cells, and what happens to the viral load? And then you can back calculate into how many viruses are produced today. Well, the answers are, there's one to 10 billion viruses produced every day in the body of an untreated person. Ooh, staggering. And when you hear, just as an aside, when you hear a, a stat like that, you think, if I had a choice of treating now or later, why would I wait when you had that kind of our application? So those of us who have been on the treat now, treat aggressively bandwagon for the last 20 years, finally have the rest of the world kind of joining us in that chorus where there was resistance uh, for quite a while, but we're all there now. Um, and the second thing is that these cells live on average of a day. So what you have is this incredible churning of virus being produced, new cells getting infected. They produce more virus than they die, and they infect and you get, it's almost unimaginable how fast this is happening. And all along, there's this churning is creating some inflammation that goes along with this. And that's what leads to a lot of the earlier, now that we, even we can treat, a lot of the earlier comorbid conditions like heart attack, strokes, liver disease, kidney disease, you name it, happening earlier in the course of someone, even when they're successfully treated. So bookmark that, I'm gonna come back to it at the end when I talk about collaborations we're doing with UW. So to finish this story, we thought we could cure people because if we block this 100%, we knew that there were some latent infected cells out here, but the guess was that those cells only lived for 14 days. So if you wait enough half-lives and you wait for those cells to die off, we figured we could cure people in about three years. Well funny thing happened on the way to the cure, and that is that these cells don't live for 14 days. They probably live for 80 months or longer. And, oh, by the way, when they replicate, if they get stimulated and replicate, the virus that's in their genome goes with them. So the, the barrier to cure is right here. You got to get rid of these guys. Identify them, attack them, get rid of them. Otherwise, you don't cure. Um, and so all of this was, everything I just told you was off this one graph. Isn't that amazing? and working with a really smart guy who's an Einstein professor at Princeton. So for younger folks, take home point, always work with people who are smart. It's really a good idea. <laughs> and we followed this up with another study where we looked at lymph nodes and we looked before and after therapy. So here's a, here's a viral load pre-therapy going down post-therapy, so it's going in this direction. But we also looked simultaneously at lymph nodes before and after therapy and found a direct correlation between the amount of cells in the body that were harboring and producing virus and viral load, take home point, viral load is directly proportional to the number of cells in the body producing virus. Very important concept. So if the viral load is very high, that means there's a lot of cells infected kicking out virus. If the viral load's low, that, that's the case too. So the question I always ask, especially to students is, well, at steady state, when one of those cells dies, it's replaced by how many cells and going back to physics 101, at steady state, the answer is one. And it doesn't matter on the viral load, it's just if a cell dies and it's replaced, at the same rate, you get steady state, and that's the case. So when you give antiretroviral therapy, you block the production of a newly infected cell, viral load drops, number of cells in the body drops proportionately. So this is how I envision it. I don't have, I have some data to support this in vitro, but. Um, this is kind of my mind's eye view of what's going on. This is not a kidney, although it looks like one. It's my lame attempt to draw a lymph node, and there's the germinal centers there, but in the paracortical region are where a lot of the CD4 cells live. And if this is the same model, that's an infected cell, and these are uninfected, unactivated, resting CD4 lymphocytes, this is what it might look like. So when the viral load is high, it's not too hard to find these guys. And the viral load is low, it's like, where's Waldo? And you've got to look through a lot of, lot of slides. But that's kind of how it goes. If we dig in, 
And this is what I think is very important. If you dig into that microenvironment where that one cell is producing in its one day lifespan, pick a number, I don't know the number, thousand viruses in the course of a day that's spitting out. And it's trying to infect one of its neighboring cells. But in the same color scheme, these are all resting un unactivated, so they're not playing. It's kind of like Night at the Roxbury with Will Ferrell and Chris Cretan, and they're trying to hit on this unsuspecting person, and they don't want anything to do with it until this drunk person comes by, and that, hey, this sounds pretty good. So that's the activated cell. <laughs> to the older folks in the audience, I apologize for that reference. But anyway, you get the picture. So this thing now sends out its vibe, it binds, it enters, it infects, and boom, there's a new cell infected. And it's steady state, that's right about the time that that sucker dies. Isn't that cool? I mean, that, this to me, this is what the fun is of translational medicine because just going from that one graph and that one lymph node study, just those two things, we gain insights into what the virus is doing and what we do when we interfere with it with antiretroviral therapy. So what does that look like? In this case, we're putting a force field around the cell, or if you want to be in an STI environment, a condom. But it's a chemical condom. So you're preventing infection of this guy as this guy sends out its vibe, even though this cell might be activated and drunk, it ain't getting infected, right? So now when this cell dies, it's not replaced, viral load drops and boom, there's the story. So that's just an example of what I find so fun about translational medicine. It's just, and being around a lot of people and, and it takes a team, it takes a village, it takes people working together of different disciplines, each bringing their own expertise to the table and sharing and batting things around. And that's what a great environment does. And that's what you have here at UW, you have that. I see it, I've been in it, I've sensed it. And it's very similar to what we have at UAB. So it happens here. And for the students and fellows and residents, it, you really, if you have any inkling of doing academic medicine, this is a great place to be. Well, let's take the story a little different direction. What about resistance? Well, resistance happens by chance, in my opinion. So let's take the example of, let's say we're in Africa, we're in Kenya, where you guys work. And back in the day, back around 2000, countries couldn't afford medicine. So what they would do is they would purchase single dose nevirapine. They'd have nevirapine as monotherapy, which is a non nuke and they would give it to a patient, a uh, mom, to prevent transmission. And it did reduce transmission from, say, 25% to 10%. But here's what happened biologically. And the reason we knew this is that we had done some studies with nevirapine monotherapy in 1993, where we actually went back and looked. But the story is, now this thing's kicking out virus. But here the, the condoms got holes in it, right? And the holes are the mutations in the reverse transcriptase where the, the drug doesn't work anymore. So all it takes is one mutation, a Y181C, or a, uh, uh, it won't see K103N as much for those people who do this every day, but a Y183N, would, uh, oh, sorry, Y183C, 181C would be one of the mutations for nevirapine. And if this virus, just by chance, if you imagine thousands of viruses being produced, you imagine in a non-kilobase virus a mistake or two every time it replicates, now a lot of that leads to stop codons and viruses that are not infectious, but every now and then by chance, there's a mistake at position 181 of reverse transcriptase. And now that chance activity, that virus now comes up and because the drug doesn't stop its replication, that cell gets infected. But here's the bad news, two parts. One, once that cell gets infected with it, every virus it produces thereafter has a Y181C. And worse, that cell, as I've already mentioned, lives on and is archived. So that's why when you're treating, you want to know the history of the resistance because somewhere in that person's T cells that are latently infected are resistant viruses from the past, archived like an archaeology dig. It's there. That's how it happens. What's more striking is when we looked at the kinetics of how fast that happens, we looked at the plasma of people who we, in retrospect, we stored their plasma, looked at it, saw that within two days, three days, we could detect some resistant virus. Within 14 days, half of that quasi-species that Wes referred to, half 
was resistant. And within 28 days, every virus in the plasma had a Y181C. That's how fast it happens. Amazing. And that's why we don't do that anymore. We don't use nevirapine monotherapy. We use full antiretroviral therapy, what we used to call heart, to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And guess what? It's 100% effective if the viral load goes undetectable in the mom. And so we basically have eliminated perinatal transmission, at least for those who are in prenatal care and get medicine. So another huge advance. Well, I'm going to segue over in the interest of time to the other part of translation, because I do want to leave time for questions. So that's, that's the basic science lab into the clinic. What about the clinic into policy? What about the clinic into clinical practice rules? And that's where outcomes research comes into play. And again, working with people here at UW, um, Mari Kitahata, Heidi Crane, others, um, this is where we've really had great success. So going back to what Wes said, when I went to UCSF in 86, um, I asked them one question, if you're building a clinic, how would you do it? And I took a lot of notes. And ultimately, one of the key points was we wish we had a database on every patient we saw. And we wish we had specimens on every patient that we had data on. Okay, I can do that. So we set up our clinic with a database from day one. And we set up our clinic with a specimen repository. Now, again, it's not every patient we saw, but there's a lot of patients who, in our basement of our, of our clinic, we've got dozens of freezers with lots of specimens. And so it's all there to be studied. But to me, really, the future is medical or health informatics. And a lot of us complain about the EMR. And it's a problem in a lot of ways, because it's hard to kind of navigate, because it wasn't designed by clinicians. It was designed by computer guys um, who just wanted to, anyway, they, they weren't well designed for us. Um, but when we started our clinic, it was mostly what I, what I called paper. So we would have a chart, whoops, we'd have a chart that looked like that. And we would write in the new medicines, for example. And then we'd send it over to a database extractor who would use code and enter information. And then they'd print out a new sheet so that everything was not scribbled. It was actually typewritten like this one was. So this would ultimately come out there. Um, but I didn't like that concept of paper. So I wanted to convert to plastic, paper to plastic, meaning I wanted to have an EMR. And in 1998, I scoured the universe of existing EMRs, and there were a lot of companies, maybe 200. And I asked the question, can we get an EMR that will let us do research? And the answer was no. <laughs> Pick. You can have, a, you can have uh, appointments. And billing, which is almost what all of them did, because somehow that seems to be important. Um, but the clinical stuff, no, 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 that's just stuff you just carry along. But uh, if you want to do research, you have to develop a research database and a research EMR. And, it, and then it should never be, and I kind of said, that's, that's not right. So we designed our own. We created our own EMR from scratch. Now, again, I didn't do this. I was just kind of a nut in the background screaming, we need to do this, and hired smart people who knew how to do systems analyses and computer programming. And um, we came up with our own EMR and we launched it in 04 and it actually worked really well, such that when we were forced to convert to the hospital system in 2011, all the providers were going, no, we love what we have, but we had to convert, so we did. And I'm sure you all have been through similar uh, painstaking seizures. Um, so anyway, it's all working now. We we're able to merge the two databases, but out of that, just if you go back to 88 to 07, we were able to add more and more data, more and more data elements. And that's maybe another take home point that this doesn't, you don't just start on day one with everything you, ha everything you want. And in fact, if I had one lesson from the entire experience of developing an EMR and thinking about this for a long time, you have to create two lists. What are the data elements you need? What are the data elements you want? Be very diligent about that. And when you get through, take the want list and throw it in the trash. Focus only on what you need, because the want list is going to interfere with your progress. Because you can always get people in the room, wouldn't it be cool if, wouldn't it be nice if? Yes, it would be nice, wouldn't it be cool, but it's going to, it's going to kill your project. It's going to kill it. So just what do you need? So we decided we needed labs and medicines and, and concurrent illnesses, and that's about it. We ate late added resistance and stuff, and this is something Heidi Crane introduced to us, which was patient-based metrics. 
Along the way, though, um, I want to make sure I finish on time. Um, along the way, though, we had a fellow right about the time we launched the EMR named James Willie. And very good guy, smart, respectful. Uh, but he came up to me right after I'd worked for four years developing an EMR. We just launched it. I'm really, really happy. It's working. Everybody's pleased. With it. He said, hey, SAG, how do you know that the data is accurate? <laughs> what? Well, how do you know the data are accurate? Well, it's the, it's the medical record. It's, it's accurate. It's the medical record. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. Um, how do you know it's real? And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, docs are kind of, they, they cut, cut corners when they're charting. And in our EMR, we made sure that we had, yeah, all the data elements that we needed. But I knew that one of the other needs was that clinicians need to write down what they're thinking. So we had free text for impression and plan. And his contention was, that the clinicians are always going to put in their plan what they want to do because they want to be able to go back and look and remember on the next visit. But they might not have taken the time to enter their change into the, into the new problem or the diagnosis, which we were analyzing. And as they, say in the, as they say in the movie, A Few Good Men, I guess he was sort of asking me, can we handle the truth? <laughs> and he was spot on, much to my chagrin, but enlightenment. It was really eye-opening for me because a lot of folks, and especially higher-ups and upper-level administrations of health systems, have this belief that if we have an EMR, we can extract data and put it in a warehouse, and we can go back and look at it, and it will give us information about quality. It will give us information about how we're doing. And yeah, sort of, but most of that data, frankly, is not accurate. In fact, it's worse than not accurate. It's misleading. And sometimes it's often just flat out wrong in terms of conclusions you draw. So from this one thing, we started doing 100% QA. Every time a patient came in, we hired work-study students from the School of Public Health, most of whom were MDs, getting their MPH in Birmingham, but usually from lived in another country. Hired them at night. They came in, reconciled the charts. What did the impression plan say? What's in the, what's in the problem list? What's in the medication? Updated it, fixed it, and got it over. So we ended up with a pretty pristine data set. That is not scalable in an easy way for a whole health system. But what it does tell me is something very critical. And that is <clears throat> that when we think we're getting information, it doesn't, it doesn't always tell us what we think it is. So let, let me put it differently. Most of you at some point in your career have worked in a lab, right? And you've done some procedure that might be 22 steps and you pipette and you mix and you do wait and you wait for enzymes. And, and at the end of the time, if you're successful, you get an answer. But if you screwed up anywhere along the line, didn't use DI water instead of ionized, well, who, who knows? You get nothing. Believe it or not, that's a blessing because you know something's wrong and you go to fix it. With data, you always get an answer. Always. Always. <laughs> and if you don't know the quality of the data, you're going to be led down so many primrose paths to, to nowhere or worse. And so if you're working at the hospital or you're working at your clinic or you're working at the VA or you're working wherever, the data says, we got data. Yes, you do but you don't have a clue most often about the quality of it. And so Willie went and presented this to some information integrity thing that's this entity that's been around for 40 years, mostly in the banking industry. So when you go to do your online banking, you don't really worry too much about errors because they, <laughs> they got that covered and they've worked on that for 40 years. This was the first time anyone had heard anyone present at their meeting on healthcare. And we ended up out of 60 not-for-profits worldwide. We got first place, all from his question of SAG, how do you know these data are accurate? Isn't that amazing? I mean, I give him tons of credit, not just for his idea, but for enlightening me to that the data systems can be flawed. I'm going to finish with a local spin. Mari Kitahata, Heidi Crane, Bill Lober, um, Stephen Von Rompe, others are here as the data center for CNEX, CFAR Network of Integrated Clinical Systems, where like-minded clinics around the country at these locations pool their data and it gets aggregated here 
and it becomes a data set that anyone in the world can access. Anyone. It could be students, could be residents, could be anyone. And if you have an idea, we will prepare a data, we'll review the concept proposal, look at the data set, and then hand you the data set or do the analysis with you. If you want specimens linked to those data, we got that too. We don't have it for every patient, obviously, <clears throat> but we do have uh, the ability to link, just like we do locally, to specimens. So it, it can lead to a lot of cool things. So let me walk you through a couple things. First off, Heidi's contribution in a legion way, Heidi and Paul Crane, um, came up with this notion of, of kiosks in the room where they answer questions on these domains and it's dynamic and it's changed since here, but you get the idea. So now you can triangulate clinical with lab with behavior. It's all there. And you can start evaluating, well, how does smoking or drinking interfere with adherence or virologic outcome or you name it. So a lot of activity. 123 consoles, that's now numbers are probably 135. Uh, about a third are from outside the scenic sites. What I love, 84% are from junior investigators, young investigators. We really stress that. So it's a real great platform for people working on Ks or working on other things. It's, it's, the, it's just really fun to be a part of something that there's no charge for. You just call and get access. This is a study that Heidi did just as an example. I mentioned that heart attacks occur more prevalently in HIV even when people are treated. So she was able to go through and we were able to adjudicate every myocardial infarction, divide them into primary MIs, which are the kind that we normally think about with the thrombus and the usual. And then there's secondary MIs that can be caused by vasospasm or, or drug use like cocaine or, or meth or uh, stress or anemia, God knows what. Um, and it was about half and half when we looked at it. And what, why that was important is because when you start doing these detailed analyses, just looking at primary, the usual risk factors come into play. But when you look at the secondaries, those risk factors don't apply. Very few people have thought about that subtle but very important distinction. They think heart attack is heart attack. No, it's not. And those types of detailed assessments are all part of the scenics effort. And then we could link the known MIs to the specimens associated with them, and you can look at out of any kind of domain you want in terms of inflammation, there were some that really stood out. And in particular, for whatever reason, D-dimer was, was a big one. And CD4 to CD8 ratio, if you divide it into quintiles, the lowest quintile of CD4 to CD8 ratio, 0.32 or less, that was the highest association we saw with a heart attack or other problems. I can't explain to you why yet that is an issue, but that's something, of course, we're looking into. And then finally, if you just take all those people with high D-dimers and you adjust for any one of these, it still remains important. So does that mean that we go out and start measuring D-dimers in everyone? Uh, no, not yet. But it does give us another pathway where intervention can be developed. Just an example. I'm going to finish with this one study we did locally. So stay with me now. This is cost. So for one year at our clinic, we captured every activity associated with a patient, a visit, hospitalization, every medication, every procedure, every lab, every everything. And we captured it all and then assumed every patient had Medicare and every, our collection rate was 100%. Okay? And all the drugs were on AWP, average wholesale price. And out of that, we determined that over the course of a year, the average cost, and this is back in 2005 or so, the average cost was $18,300 per patient per year. If they had low CD4 counts, it was about double that. And if they had a high CD4 count, it was much less. So it has face validity in terms of what you might expect. But here is the take home point. If we take that $18,300 a year and divvy it up in terms of what's driving the cost, 75 to 80% is medications. Hospitalization is 7%. So somebody is in the hospital, yeah, it's expensive, but not many people are in the hospital. So by the whole population, it's only 7%. Diagnostics here. Can you all see this? <laughs> Can you see that? For one year per patient, if we have 100% of patients with Medicare, we collect everything that we're allowed 
legally. We collect $359 per patient per year. That's it. So if you have a thousand patient clinic, that's $359,000. That's for everything. Lights, utility, space, nurses, social workers, front desk people, physicians, nurse practitioners. Nurse, huh? Are you kidding me? So this becomes very important when I go to Congress and say the Ryan White Care Act is very important because but for the Ryan White Care Act, 80% of people or so in the United States with HIV would get no care. Amazing. We couldn't make it. Madison Clinic wouldn't be functioning in 1970. No, nobody would be functioning. But here's another thing to argue. Look at this, and I'm going to leave you with this. Medications. We are able to control the cost of everything in healthcare except medications. Right? If you work on the you work on the hospital side, there's rules, regulations of what you can charge and how you get penalized. And if you if you falsely charge a level four when it was a really a level three, you could get thrown in jail. Right? And they tell us what they're going to pay for a level three or a level four. We don't tell them. But medications. That's the Wild West, and it's killing us. Now, in fairness, I'm not against pharmaceutical companies. If you go back to the history of HIV, those medicines were developed by really smart scientists at pharma, and they should be rewarded for taking those risks and developing those drugs. But where is, where is that threshold where it becomes excessive? And I think we're well past it. Use hepatitis C as an example. Right? Hepatitis C, a 12-week course of therapy is $90,000. If we treated all 4 million people in the United States at that cost, it would exceed the entire Medicare budget for medicines over a course of a year. Now, in truth, the competition for the first time in maybe any disease has actually driven the cost down some. So now it's maybe 50000 or at the VA it might be 40000 or 35000 But that's for medication the cost in principle, once you finish all the costs, not research, it's $200, $240 to produce for 12 weeks. So the margin between $240 and 40,000 is a good percent. Is that right? And if it is right, okay. But if it's not right, why is it happening? And why is it being allowed to happen? And what can we do about it? And so my final slide, I got so pissed off about this stuff, I wrote a book as a rant, but I couched it in a story of the AIDS epidemic. But I think we have to tick our heads out of the sand or open up our turtle shell and get a little bit more active in terms of letting our voice be heard because we are the advocates for our patients. And we have to take these data and translate another type of translational medicine into sound public policy that creates a health system we can live with. And that's my final comment. Thank you very much. Okay, you know, that maybe five minutes for questions or something. Does anybody want to rant back at me? Thoughts? Mike, this is uh, really, this is Wes. You oh, know, hi, Wes. I'm like God. Oh, you're over here. Oh, hey. Uh, it was a beautiful talk. And Thank where you. do you think the, the next frontier in HIV uh, is going? And yeah. uh, if you get more time, tell us how to solve the problem of the medications. Okay. Um, the frontier, I think, is threefold. Cure, we've been talking about that. I'm not terribly hopeful. I think... It's like curing cancer. You mean it's the same? You got to get rid of every single nest of cells that are involved or control them some kind of. Way. Not easy. Vaccine. Working on it here. That'd be great. But we've talked about the quasi species and the immune response. Very difficult. And the third is where we're working, where I'm working on mostly now, and that's what I call the natural history of HIV in the treatment era. So now that we've got people on treatment, what's what happens to them? And what we're seeing isn't particularly nice. The people are getting earlier diseases associated with inflammation. So we have to figure out what we can do. And that's why I think this D-dimer pathway or this CD4, CD8 ratio pathway might start giving us a hint. And my, my wild 
crazy idea is that if all this stuff is happening at an earlier age than people who are uninfected, and there's that gap, say 10 or 15 years, the thesis could be something happens when somebody's infected with HIV irrespective of treatment that triggers a pathway towards more accelerated decline in their health functioning in their host. If we can compare that to other people and go back and forth, maybe, this is the crazy part, maybe we can determine where on the pathway of aging that went and what was that trigger spot? What was that, what was that enzyme or what was that, what was that mechanism by which the trigger happened that seems to be irreversible? And if we could back it up and go back to that spot and reverse it, not only would we help HIV patients, we could help all of us, right? Because it wouldn't be exactly Ponce de Leon, but it would give us an opportunity to find drugs that could actually slow or retard the aging process. That's my wild and crazy idea. As far as what to do about medications, I think, just as a proposal, so take or leave it, I think we have a two-tiered review when a new drug comes up for, uh, and we have to do it for all drugs. Two-tiered review. You do FDA safety and efficacy like we currently do, check approval, but then you have a second review that looks at cost, cost of development, cost based on population, and the government determines a ceiling above which they will not pay, and that becomes public. We will not pay more than this. If you can negotiate lower, knock yourself out, but that's our ceiling on that drug. It's especially important for biologics, which are totally killing us now. And for reasons that nobody can see, yeah, it's a little bit more expensive to make a biologic, but not that much more. And you look at what Europe is paying for them, and it's a lot less. Where, where the chaos of our system is enabling this injustice, in my opinion, to go forward. And my final point is we, we need to change the laws and allow importation of generic medicines into the United States. That'll get rid of the valiant, you know, Daraprim, $750 for a pill that costs maybe two cents. We've got to do that kind of thing. So that's my soapbox rant on that. Thank you for asking. Yeah, you have a question? No? Yeah, uh, yeah so first of all, uh, my favorite slide was the one on the future. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm the IT medicine director for uh, UW Medicine. Great. And uh, so I think that's great. I was curious a little bit about your observation about the accuracy of the record in your uh, UAB 1917 clinic. Um, what do you think about the accuracy of the record when those patients are hospitalized? Do you use those data? And if so, are you, you have the same uh, suspicions about them? Yeah, um, I haven't looked, to be honest. It's, it's hard enough to do the outpatient, but we just sort of take the diagnoses from the hospital and, and we use a DRG to determine what the likely cost is for that diagnosis, but I haven't delved into that at all. But you're spot on. I mean, I, my guess is that the hospital pays more attention to the accuracy of diagnosis because it's related to billing. And if anything, it's probably maybe between us overcoded sometimes to maximize the return on whatever that patient was in for. Um, so if you write down urinary tract infection and bacteremia, you're corrected to say this is urosepsis because the pay rate's better. And sort of accurate, but I mean, that's sort of artificial. So to me, it's probably more accurate in terms of diagnoses, maybe. But I don't know, but it's a, it's a fun study. And, and I think the future is, I'm playing right into your hand here, but the future is not only just the service of informatics, it's the science of informatics, right? And studying these questions, and can we find a way to automate accuracy? And I don't know how to do that, but hopefully you do. I've got some ideas. Yeah. And educate people, that's the third one. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fun.